It's a matter of flow. Hello, I'm Ryan, and welcome to Ball in Europe. And today, it's a bit of a different one. It's all about lorry marketing, and uh, what exactly, you know, is the best course of action with him over the course of what is going to be an odd season for the Utah Jazz. The idea sort of came to me after he left that game with back spasms a few days back, well, it'll be over a week back now when this video goes live, and essentially the course, the goals, the desires for the season ahead so I'm going to look into this from a few different angles, but if you haven't already, please subscribe. Uh, the thing is up there somewhere, and it really helps. And now, let's talk about Laurie. So yeah, we have been here before. For uh, the Jazz fans watching, they'll remember very clearly what was going on. Any Susie Yangi uh, Finnish fans watching will also remember this, but the rest of you might need a bit of a refresher. So September 2022, we're all around the world watching Eurobasket, and it's great. I was traveling all over, watching some great basketball. I had a great time. But a couple of people were not having the best of times, one of whom you would have assumed, but turned out not to be the case, was Laurie Markkinen. Because Markkinen came in with, he's getting traded, rumors circling around him. This guy is meant to be the superstar, the savior for his Finnish national team, and the biggest possible distraction in his professional life is just hanging over him like this. And what happened? Everything went fine. Uh, he had uh, an extraordinary tournament. He guided Finland to their best performance in Eurobasket. In you're talking like 60 years. It was phenomenal. It was great. They gave the fright of their lives to Spain, who eventually won it in those quarterfinals. Marketing showed that he wasn't going to be phased by trade rumors. And trust me, there were other guys knocking around there who looked like they wanted to be anywhere but Eurobasket because of the trade rumors facing them and their careers. And so, yeah, you go, right, that's pretty cool. And, you know, he quickly showed in that 22-23 season when, of course, he got MIP, that he was, you know, a key piece, you would assume, for this jazz rebuilding project. And that's the thing, this is meant to be your three of the rebuilding project now. You may have noticed it's it's not. Because, yeah, he started out pretty hot. And it was like, uh, you know, this is working. And so he looked like the piece sticks to the keep. And then last year came along. And, um, well, the Jazz haven't really uh, done much in terms of they're getting better on the court yet. But they have done a lot in the building up assets. And so the thing is, Laurie is now about to hit his peak years. So what do you do? Well, you sign a contract, but you sign a contract, that extension, the three-year deal, the day after that deal can be turned into a tradable one during the coming season. And that is what brings us to now. It is a lost season, but it can't be a fully lost season. Like, your issue with an athlete of any kind is, they need to be playing ball. They need to be playing sports, you know? They need to be doing what they do. You can't just uh, put him uh, into the rafters for the whole season, you know, and go, right, we'll see you next summer, Larry. You know, we'll just pay you to sit in your backside. No, you've got to use him. Uh, the question is how much you use him is the thing. It's all about intelligence uh, is what this is. And this is why I was really the crux of this video is intelligent use of Larry Mark in this season. Like, barring a serious injury, the Jazz should be looking at working out different ways they will want to use this star like you know as they look to build into next season and into the season beyond that uh, which would of course be the last of Markkinen's current contract so that you're in a position when he is at his it'll be his age 30 year starting would be the stage at which he's needing a new contract is how i'd put it he'll have uh, just turned 30 at the end of the previous season uh, once he's three years are up and so you're at that stage of, well, you want to be in a situation, ideally, where if he is a key piece of piece of this plan to bring the Jazz to that next level, it's a plan that he's going to go, yeah, let's, I, I appreciate how it's worked so far. Because he's shown a bit of patience over these two years, I think, in terms of we're at year three and it's year one again. Like, it is year one again. And so now he is the undisputed star of the Jazz. A lot of that's to do with outgoings, granted. But you go, right. We have this amount of money dedicated to this guy for now, but obviously that number is likely to increase in two years' time, barring catastrophic injury. Where are we going to be position-wise in those two years that we want to use him that way? Because obviously once this season ends, marketing becomes tradable again, 
and his happiness will depend an awful lot on what the off-court movements are in terms of getting people in, moving people along, uh, and turning flipping those assets essentially into you know on-court talent that can contribute now. As in, well, I say now, I don't mean right now, because I was right now the Jazz stink and kind of want to stink. But I mean, once Lowry, you know, is back there next season, that he feels the team is taking a step forward, is using the assets it's built up. So a key part of that is going to be ensuring that he is playing basketball this season. Now, obviously, back spasms, yeah, straight away, sit him. But you don't, like, sit him for, like, you know, uh, you know, ages. You sit him for what's needed. So obviously, give him the rest. Then you get that four-game road trip that you're currently on at the moment. Uh, and uh, you go again. And so... A lot of it is going to be strategic use of his minutes. Like, will he get shut down towards the end of the season? More than likely. But that's almost more the reason to try and make sure that you get some good basketball out of him between now and the uh, eventual, I'm not going to say inevitable, the eventual shutdown we are likely to see uh, come, you know, mid-March. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough one to manage because you've got a guy who's clearly, you know, star level, could contribute at a very high level on a championship team who is going to be playing on a team which is clearly playing for as good a lottery position as it can get this season. And it's it's a very tough place to manage a talent like that, essentially, for the Jazz. So balance is the biggest question this season with marketing, how you do that. And that brings us to what comes next. So remember, Markkinen, his goal is to do as well in the NBA as he can, but he is hitting his peak of peak years. This is his age 27 season. That's essentially one of his peak years being thrown away. He, now he's betting himself here by signing that deal at a point where it couldn't be traded. But then you're going, okay, the age 28, age 29, age 30, and maybe age 31, we can say, uh, are going to be the peak peak, you know? So we got like, this is the age 27 season. Uh, and you're kind of going, right, these are the years we want marketing to be at his very, very best. And he certainly wants to be at his very, very best those seasons too. So as a result of that, you're kind of going, what? can the Jazz bring in around him? Now, there's a lot of future picks. We know that. Uh, some of them convey this year. Some of them convey in 2027. Some of them don't convey until 2029. And, you know, you kind of go, right, I think it's 2029 for the latest important ones. But the point is, there are picks there. Are they going to stay as first-round picks? And I think that this is the point where you have to start looking at what can we flip these picks for? And the problem, really, and Utah is one of the reasons for it, is that uh, the price of a star or the price of a top-tier talent has rocketed up in recent years in terms of what you have to pay for him in terms of draft capital. Uh, because, you know, the draft capital situation now in terms of what you need to give to get somebody, we saw what we got with the haul for Gobert, we've seen it with other hauls. It's a lot, like, it's an awful lot to get in top-tier talent. So Utah's going to be looking, kind of going, what we what are we going to have to do? Like, is it going to be free agency? Like, the Jazz have a lot had issues bringing in free agents. I think that market isn't as much of a challenge as it was before because I think of the way the modern NBA is, that players are more happy to go to a situation where they feel they can win. They aren't as worried about the market itself. And so, like, I think Utah is basically a more attractive place for free agents now than it was, say, at the, uh, uh, what was it, the end of the booze era, you know. That's probably the easiest comparison. And so you look at it there and you go, right, okay, a bit more manageable. So the free agency situation mightn't actually be that tough. And then it's a case of, well, can you package the picks with other people, basically, to try and turn it into something more? Now, obviously, you might still end up using all those picks, which is fine. But the problem then is, what's your long-term plan with Laurie Markkinen? Because Laurie Markkinen has two things he cares about. One is being the best player he can be in the NBA. And the best situation to do that, obviously, is not content continually being the guy who's bringing along these youngsters hoping that one of them is going to be the next ant in terms of speed of accelerating to being a superstar. And, uh, you know, that's a bit of a gamble. And I think Markkinen will understandably be kind of going, wouldn't be opposed to trading years two or three if it's looking like that's the road you're going. Now, the upside for Utah, if you do that, is you will get a crazy bounty for him. The downside is you won't really have much else worth sending anymore, uh, which is not great. So your goal should really be to keep him happy. One of the ways keeping him happy, obviously, is uh, you've seen Finnish coaches coming in as assistants over the last couple of seasons. Tuomas El Salo, uh, of course, is uh, there. He's, he's a huge, hasn't he? Uh, yeah, he is. Uh, uh, but like we've seen, you know, coaches come in and uh, take roles. And they've done bits, but... Uh, also, obviously, he likes playing for Finland, and I'm looking forward to seeing him in Eurobasket, uh, assuming he's healthy, and uh, probably well-rested after what will likely to be a short end to the Jazz season, let's be honest. 
But he doesn't just want to be a hero for Finland. He wants to be a hero for the Utah Jazz, not just the best guy in a bad team. He wants to be remembered in SLC as a guy who brought them to another level, who brought them, you know, to days where they could think of the Stockton and Malone era. You know, he wants to be part of that story. And if they're going to do that, they're going to have to get started getting smart with the assets. It really is just an element of intelligence at this stage. Like, look at the assets. How do you use the assets now? That's the real question. Like, and I think Mark and in, you know, his team seems confident. I think, though, confidence is great. Seeing that confidence were paid is what was going to matter now from the Jazz side. They've got to show that it's right for the marketing side of things to be confident that the Utah Jazz is going to get this together. It's a pretty smart organization. I'd be confident they can do it. The one obvious question is, well, this was meant to be year three and it's year one again. So that's the big thing hanging over this. Um, you know, take note, as they say. Uh, but we do videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Obviously, it's all basketball from a European perspective. For those of you who are watching who are not Euros, who don't know, uh, I'm Emmett, uh, as I said at the start, but I'm actually based in Ireland. I'm from Dublin. I have been to Utah uh, for games twice, uh, many, many years ago. For context, it was uh, the first game I ever went to in the NBA ever was a Jazz win with uh, Boozer, D-Will, and uh, AK-47 against the We Believe Warriors. Uh, so that gives you a bit of, wow, you have, oh, it's in Salt Lake two years in a row. The next year, it was the Jazz destroying a uh, bad Raptors team who still made the playoffs because the East was really in the doldrums back then. But my first NBA games were both in SLC. So there you go. Uh, and listen, if you enjoyed this, thanks very much for coming along. We do lots of shorts as well during the week, you notice, but we do our big videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And until, I suppose, well, Monday now, I will see you soon.